Hello and welcome to this lecture on activists online. Um, I hope my voice is not too um, bad, but we'll make it a try to record this lecture. Okay, so there is quite a few things that we're going to talk about today, starting with the general introduction about activist participation and agency. Look at the chapters in the Brands at um, All book. Um, look at some of my articles, Identity Negotiation and Activist Participation, that I wrote together with others, and then the Typology article I wrote together with Christina, as well as the article on Activist Capital, since this particularly deals with power, which is one of the core concepts in the course. And then we end with the Earl and Kimport book, which I think you will find very helpful, especially for your uh, group work, because there are some really um, hands-on ideas here. Okay, so let's start. So um, activist participation, what are we talking about here? Well, departing from my um, tripartite delineation, we're talking here about um, participation initiated from actors outside the parliament but directed towards it. Um, so this is uh, participation in relation to an authority, here the state, again, in its different levels. I mean, it can be on a municipal level, um, regional or part, part, uh, national level. So if we compare to the last lecture on politicians online, this is a slightly wider definition of participation and here I've been particularly inspired by Verbania's definition of participation as concerning not only um, participation in relation to um, within within with the purpose of um, changing I mean voting and joining political parties but also participation that deals with changing um, decision influencing decision makers in general. And such participation may occur outside the parliament. Now the question here uh, is whether digital media uh, can be of any help for actors outside the parliament um, to initiate to um, agency and participation. Well, um, once again it depends on from which stance you look at it. I mean, what are your views on politics, the political and political actors? I mean, if you take a liberal view on um, political, uh, on, on the political and political actors, then you uh, conceive of actors as individuals with preconceived interests. So, I mean, one, one way of looking at this could be, for example, rallies against the refugee camps in your area or buildings in the in your area where you have your house because it will lower the um, uh, perhaps the 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 price on the market of this house and will make the according to you a, a generally more unsafe area so this type of rallies we see where people organize to to stop certain things that the municipality has um, uh, um, proposed would be a way to look at activists and to initiate activist participation from a liberal point of view, viewing um, political actors as um, as individuals with preconceived interest. However, a more deliberative take on this would then be to invite actors um, to to join and deliberate and discuss about things. Because, in contrast to the liberal view, the deliberative um, democratic view of the political actor is that his or her interests are not preconceived, they are formed in discussion with others. Hence, to initiate act or action, if you take this particular view on humanity, human action and politics, would be, for example, to uh, call for participation in deliberative budgeting, for example, um, or other discussion uh, meetings, uh, etc. A more social democratic view of this, viewing political action as groups in the provision of equal opportunities for everyone. I mean, we see a lot of this type of, of uh, action initiated in society where particular groups have fought for their rights and have been addressing 
actors as part of groups that should fight for their rights. I mean, the LGBT movement, the women's movement, um, the the handicapped, disabled people's movement, etc., etc. So there are many types. I mean, this would be how you would address or try to initiate action if you would take it from a more social democratic perspective. And then finally, um, the radical democratic uh, perspective view um, actors as part of groups with very conflicting interests. And then um, the, the way to initiate action here would be to, to highlight these conflicting interests. I mean, I take one example here, the group The Humanists, who are generally against the religious influence in society in Sweden. They are very vocal in Sweden. Maybe you have them in your countries as well. Um, so they are very much portraying every type of religious influence as a threat to a humanist secular society. So they address then their um, um, it tries to initiate action by formulating uh, these conflicting lines in society between secularism and religious belief. Um, so that's another example of this. So, okay, so this then have, ties back to the previous lectures we have had on politics, political and different views of to view political actions and agency. The question here then since we deal with digital media, what, what is digital media's role in activist participation? Well, I mean, once again, it depends on your different uh, take on political action, but we can see in general that activist participation is increasing in society. I mean, in contrast to uh, parliamentary participation, which is decreasing, this is increasing. Why is this? Has social media any role in this? Do they have any role in this? Do they have, how they contribute to this general increase? It is because it becomes easier to organize and coordinate actions, to spread uh, causes and opinions, make uh, your ideas visible. Perhaps, perhaps not, what do you think? So this is when we enter into the, um, the tour of the globe here uh, in the uh, Brunset Al book, uh, starting with the US or in particular the um, well multinational active well activist well group social movement if you so wish Sylvain will perhaps have a different definition of it of anonymous and Christian here in the chapter ten a particular focus on uh, two rape cases in the US in which Anonymous played an important role to make these cases visible. And he, he uh, particularly highlights social media's role in the US to, to raise awareness for, for example, um, police brutality against blacks, etc. And he also conceives of here Anonymous as a contemporary version of feudal bandits having occupied the space between lord states and the peasantry. I mean, basically the public sphere, if you so wish. It's an interesting definition of it. And then they are arguably based on ideas of cyber libertarianism, even though he, 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 he problematizes that, studying their actions um, in these two cases, in Maryville and, and Steubenville. Uh, where he uh, says that, yes, on the one hand, they uh, argue for the liberty on the um, cyber liberty, freedom of speech free uh, online. On the other hand, they are also calling for state actions and centralized state actions in these cases. And in these cases, social media was used for documentation. Well, I mean, social media is used for documentation. We use social media in our daily life for documentation and but but by using social me media to document our lives and what we're doing also makes it hackable which was the case in in Starbenville and Maryville that these uh, accounts of these rape cases were hacked by anonymous and then put online in order to put a spotlight on these issues create visibility and engage uh, action on this which and uh, action happened i mean these cases were were reopened from having been abandoned, yeah. So, so anonymous were very successful here. Um, uh, so, so they used they hacked the platform, social media platform, in order to get information, and they used the same platform to to, to spread uh, and expose those who was considered guilty. Now, Christian says that 
the um, do so social media was very successful in raising political uh, public opinion here. At the same time, um, it increased the damage on victims because of increased and continuous exposure and visibility of the cases, as well as the case that uh, non-involved individuals were outed wrongly here uh, in some cases, or perhaps, well, wrongly more, I mean, depends on what moral stance you take on this. So this is also a problem here, um, having a group self-proclaimed um, um, the policing of the internet and deciding what is right and wrong that perhaps cannot be held accountable here. So this is some of the problems that Christian raises in chapter 10. Move on to Spain here and especially the group of the indignados, the enraged ones that you have heard about um, I'm sure, protesting against um, the Spanish government uh, in the Puerta del Sol in Madrid, uh, most notably, and um, in order against the um, anti-austerity, um, well, against austerity plans, etc. Uh, and the chapters of this, uh, the authors of this chapter um, basically makes the connection between social media and mobilization. Social media is very good for mobilizing. Uh, action. It bypassed traditional organization, most of organization, and it's easy to involve like-minded in collective action offline as well as online. So it makes it easier to, to coordinate and mobilize participation. If it's good for sustaining participation, it's a different story here, but according to others, it's good for, for organ for, for getting them to, to, to act. Um, and they also highlight that this type of activism is different in the sense that it has a diffuse leadership. Leadership is not as important when organizing on social media. A much broader notion of membership. Um, and also how social media is used to, for, for, to, to put together smaller types of organization in one course. Huh? creating a sense of we-ness, as I also talk about, as we also talk in my uh, article on I, I'm activist identifications, the vagueness of the we, and we'll come back to that. And they also, but the particular interest in this chapter is how, how the content of, of the messages online contribute to action. I mean, how, how are the frames of the information that spreads online, how does that contribute to action? And we also talk about friends in my article, so that you can make um, links there. Um, and the authors find here that meaning um, and the content, the meaning of the content that the indignados used were changed over time. Um, depending on which actors were involved, and there were many types of actors and many types of organizations. It also shows that well-connected uh, users or nodes in the network, if so wish, uh, made it easier to spread content. And this is also something that Karina Hoon has has discussed uh, in her in her concept of gateway nodes. I mean, well-connected nodes make it easier to spread information. So there is indeed a hierarchy of users even here in these um, um, in these uh, organizations. Um, and But she says that, um, well, they say, the authors say that uh, this social media then leads to a new um, mode of organization. So, so the um, arguments that, that uh, social media implies an absence of organization, which is kind of uh, an argument that is put forward by Earl and Kimput in their book, um, the authors here said that, well, it's not exactly true. There is some type of organization and you could work with, I mean, you know, well-connected actors, etc. However, um, it's, it's a different mode. So it's not, it's not the absence, it's a different mode of organization. Moving on to Turkey and the Getsi Park protests. So how here in this... Um, in this case, social media um, allowed users to be part of the construction of a new cities argued, challenging state controlled media and using uses and gratification theory, the authors 
argue that social media gratify news need and I mean the most well-known example here is when CNN International showed the massive protests and the police brutality against the protest at the Getsy Park in, in uh, at the Taksim Square in Istanbul um, CNN Turkey showed dolphins and so <laughs> indeed there was a need for for um, for an alternative news source rather than state-controlled media in this more authoritarian regime. And social media gratifies that need for alternative news sources. Social media, according to the author, also gratifies the need to connect with like-minded groups. Easier to connect with like-minded, get uh, access news from alternative news sources. Um, however, the... Um, the um, results of their study of the Getsy Park protests show that they were mainly using Twitter to be updated and um, to be updated on what's happening rather than generating news themselves. So they were using it in a connective mode, connective action as, as one of the popular concepts today, to, to connect, spread, to be updated rather than generate news themselves. So this is you to connect, spread, update, yeah, rather than generate news themselves, as I just said. And you, this, this focus on updating is indeed something that I myself has been um, highlighting, as you will see a little bit later. Um, so yeah, I mean, you see here, there is a lot of um, information here that might be of interest for you in your group work, how to use social media. Is it good to use for to, to generate news? Perhaps not. Is, is it good for, for, for spread of information, perhaps, etc. So you can see in these chapters here, you have many hints, ideas of best practices how to use social media for your group work. I'm going to China, and here, of course, I'm particularly interested in, in our Chinese students here. What do you think about this depiction of China here? Is it true? Is it false? Um, the chapter largely depicts China as an authoritarian regime. It is a one-party state, no doubt. Um, but as such, um, the author argue here that it faces what they call the di dictator's dilemma, that is, imposing control over social media, or should they embrace social media in order to keep up with the world? Um, and yeah, I mean, the whole chapter departs from this that social media can be both empowering for activists, but it can also be used for state control. Uh, and in the case of China, is um, is that basically the challenges brought about by cyber activism towards, I mean, the one party state here, um, is relatively unthreatening. And, and the reason why is because they are um, these cyber protests are relatively bad. I mean, they are not jointly organized. They're badly organized. They are weak. They have no shared agenda. Um, also, it seems that the um, the um, strategy by the state here has been to adapt and accommodate our cyber activism. So there is a tolerance of certain forms of, for example, voicing criticism against certain things, etc. Whereas when social media is used to try to mobilize protest, um, it is, it is um, stifled against them. Um, so it's, well, stifled against you say that, but it's pushed down, I say. It's, uh, this is when the state, um, state acts, so to speak. Um, so in, in, in some lens, Chinese netizens are not particularly politically motivated. I mean, it could be that they are generally happy with the state. Huh? Um, and, and even if there are innovative activist usage in China, state is successful in controlling the internet by, by putting upon the local service providers to control it, uh, to make laws that, that forces them to control the internet, you know, allowing some form of criticism while stifling mobilizations. Okay, so let's move to South Korea here. Um, chapter 20, well, 
this is, I mean, for those of you who are interested in context and the role of context in social media, this chapter is uh, in protest participation, activist participation, use of social media. This is a very interesting chapter in that it, it takes context very seriously. In, and the context here in South Korea is that it, it's a young democracy. The population is very tech savvy. Um, still, it's, it's a collectivist society. Uh, marked by Confucianist uh, tradition, philosophy. Um, still, it's one of the most wild uh, countries in the world. It's also a very culturally hom homogenous country. I mean, quite surprising the low level of immigration in South Korea, I must say. So it's very ho homogenous. Still, <clears throat> Korean politics is unstable, polarized and emotional. Um, Politicians have had a hard time to deal with the economic crisis, and there are political scandals. Um, at the same time, there is a malfunctioning newspaper market, mass media market, when it comes to newspapers. Um, so this has led to a generally low uh, confidence in, in, in political institutions. Hence, social media or digital media is used here for information acquisition, to get, I mean, as a news source, to get, to be updated. Huh? Um, um, as well as to network among peers, circulate messages and organize activities. I mean, in one way, I find these um, conclusions, I mean, the, they are the conclusions you find in also in other contexts, in the Indignados case, in the Getsi Park protest, social media is used to organize, circulate messages, be updated, mobilize. So even though that we have a very different context here, South Korea, we still have the same result. I think this is um, interesting to, to think about. Uh, finally, here we have uh, Christina's um, work on the anti-fascist protests and fascist protests in Germany. Um, the the Arctic, I mean, I wrote together with her, so I'm not going to talk so much about that because it comes, comes later in the article. But basically, I mean, one a core concept of hers is the idea of country public here, the social media as, as a locus for um, for those who are not heard in the in the general public or in mass media. So uh, especially for nationalists here, right wing groups. I mean, in Sweden we have had the um, the case of the soldiers of Odin um, in the press lately. Um, a right wing nationalist group going on the streets of Stockholm trying to. Uh, enforce law and order from their very um, uh, right-wing nationalist perspective. But it's also used by... So, I mean, she looks at protests in Leipzig and Dresden where Nazis organized march and anti-fascists um, uh, rallies against these marches. Um, and social media is especially important for to, to, um, to oppose state actors or the dominant actors since it can be considered a counter-public, as well as, um, you know, a post-mainstream media, provide an alternative to mainstream media, as we also saw in Turkey, uh, and also to uh, oppose state actors, as the state and the state actors here, namely the police is a particular prominent state actor that they uh, impose. In connection to this, I also want to mention the Uni Brent, uh, activism in Austria, since this is um, part of the article as well that I wrote together with Christina, um, Alexander and Judith, um, which deals with student protests in Austria in 2009. There were generally um, protests started against the kind of neoliberalization of state education, higher education, um, which gathered a lot of um, supporters or generally from the left but especially among students and social media was used here um, under the um, hashtag of Unibrent or and the slogan of Unibrent and they occupied I mean the largest lecture hall in Vienna the Audimax. So this is also a case where we see how social media has been used and that we discuss in the article um, that I discuss in the article together with my own um, case on Adi Bafas, which I will talk about next, Christina's cases of the anti-fascist and fascist marches in Germany, um, as well as this Unibrand case. So my own research has dealt with the Asperdam Bafas. So this was a Bafas in the southern part of um, um, Stockholm, um, 
which was community run um, but city owned so basically and I was part of this group myself so I should be transparent about that so basically we run the bathhouse um, but it needed to be renewed so they, we asked the municipality to give us money to renew it and all of a sudden the municipality realized that oh we have a bathhouse on this attractive piece of land let's close it down let's build some uh, kindergarten there instead so there started to be protests again to save the bathhouse and this is actually from the Museum of Architecture um, uh, their gingerbread house competition. Here we see this Stockholm city of Stockholm guillotining the, the bath house. Um, yeah, so where are we? I mean, this is the inner city of Södermalm. Here we have Aspuden, and here is the Aspuden bath house just by the subway here. And the, the generally the protests engage people from Misomakransen and Aspuden, so these two areas. And there was a lot of social media used, um, Twitter was used, there was a blog mainly used to mock local politicians. Several Facebook uh, pages, starting with the um, uh, Save the Aspen and Bathhouse, which later transformed into the southern suburb of Södra Förstaden. There's also this Ning page, which perhaps merits a little bit more of an explanation. Ning is a, is a platform for... Um, for um, um, I mean, you can say it's a it's a Facebook for a particular group. So here is the southern suburb. You can you have your own page with your profile picture. You can join groups. You can invite others. You can send messages. So it's kind of like a Facebook page for a particular group. So this name page was also used in the actions. Um, like the main results I found. Uh, with the social media was that um, social media was very good to connect to the course. Um, so many people connected to this, say, the Aspud and Bathhouse course or demand um, online. Uh, and then by connecting, you all of a sudden get a lot of information streaming towards your social media site. And in some kinds of cases, this led to offline actions. So it seems that there is some kind of causality from connecting, getting information that then kind of pushes you to, to action. Uh, and also the importance of being up, updated, as, as also in chapter 13 by in the Getsy Park protest. Importance of being updated, what's happening, so this, this push to be constant there on social media to see what, hap what happens. And then to act. If, for example, on Twitter there is something, it's called for mobilization, come to the... Uh, come to the bathhouse, the police are, are on its way, etc. And another um, finding is that expressive motivations are very important here. Uh, expressive in the sense that um, the, the negotiation of the activist identity or um, uh, was very important. I'm the kind of person that um, uh, are against... Uh, um, state actions against police brutality I'm the kind of person that is pro uh, local initiatives etc uh, etc et so um, very generally about my findings so in this article on the identity and negotiation in activist participation so it's me Christina and uh, Judith and Alex that writes together drawing upon in my bathhouse uh, case, uh, Christina's um, nationalist and anti-fascist marches in Germany, as well as the Austrian Uni Brent case. Um, and we're particularly interested in, in activist in, in identity identity negotiation. We argue that social media platforms influence the way individuals negotiate their activist identities and communicate their political positions. So this is the starting point. And drawing upon Cherry Turkle's very famous books from 95, here we have Cherry on the picture, that computers in general and the internet in particular redefine how we negotiate our identities. Um, so identity negotiation is important to look at. Um, so this is the general starting point. Uh, we have our three cases. Um, um, social media increasingly affords the explore, exploration and expression of, of our multifaceted identities, huh? the expressive rationality. 
uh, processes of identification is could be considered as motivations or driving forces or incentives for collective action that I'm the kind of person who um, is against uh, police brutality therefore there is a call now on the Twitter feed that the police is coming to the bathhouse and therefore I have to act in order to stay true to my identity here and my activist identity so this is also a starting point here um, and so the question is, how is this identity negotiated among these activists and how does this contribute to action? Um, well, I mean, first of all, a general um, finding that we find is that the other is very important. Um, and it seems the stronger the other, the, the, the easier it is to, to form an identity of the us. And this is especially the case in Christina's articles. I mean, the other there are neo-Nazis, which made it very um, easy to, 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 to gather support, to, to, um, I mean, to, to uh, appeal to, to activist identities in order to fight this particular other. So the stronger the other, in the sense, the, the, more, um, uh, the more strong or the more, how say, controversial perhaps the other, the easier to, to appeal to this identity and to, to uh, get people to and mobilize them into action. Um, and and it's not only neo Nazis, but the state here is another of these strong others. Um, um, left and right, we'll return to that later. So the importance of the other. And the other, um, uh, the other finding is that I mean the, the, the that has to be strong, but also um, the more um, vague. The notion of the us, the easier it is to include others. Uh, and in discourse theoretical terminology, you can talk about um, an empty signifier here, the, or the um, equivalent bond. What makes us and us? What is it that makes us connect to each other? The vaguer that is, I mean, of course, the more important. Uh, the more easy it is to connect various groups. And once again, Christina's example here. Um, basically where the us is mainly those who are against neo-nazis i mean that's a very vague us but you could clearly see how that managed to gather a lot of different groups together fighting them you had the anti-fascist offer anti-fascist action i mean the radical left if you so wish together with people from the church who rallied against uh, this to and in some ca cases also together <coughs> As well as um, as generally people who wanted to save their families from from this, um, etc. And you could also see another uh, very vague us that managed to gather many different people was, I mean, the ordinary people versus the politicians, and the ordinary people versus the corrupt politicians. Another one of these is the left versus the right. And it's also very vague what is included in the left and uh, what is included in the right. And this also leads us to um, to uh, the uh, uh, final thing in our um, chapter here, which resonates with, with the chapter on indignados. Um, I mean, the action frames. I mean, what are the, what kind of frames and how to frame content in order to mobilize action and, and appeal to this identity? Well, I mean, freedom of speech, grassroots democracy, uh, authoritarian politicians versus ordinary citizens are these um, are such action frames as well as the left versus the right and we find this very interesting uh, when I studied political science in the nine, late 90s it was argued that the left versus the right this kind of dichotomy would become obsolete this is absolutely not the case this is very much used to, to incite action and to call for identifications All right, I will stop here because I have to cough and then I will return later.